Good morning and welcome to Horizon West Church Online. My name is Christian and I serve as part of our guest service team. We wanna thank you so much for joining us online this morning. If this is your first time joining our church online, we are so thankful that you're spending your Sunday morning with us. We'd love the opportunity to get to know you and the easiest way that you can make that happen is to text the word CONNECT to 40777 at any point in our service and fill out the digital connect card. We know that there are many people in need of a message of hope during this difficult season. So we encourage you to hit the share button on whatever platform you're viewing from to invite those within your circle to hear the good news of Jesus. We hope you enjoy our service today. We will catch up with you at the end to let you know how to take your next best steps. See you soon.
Do you believe that he is the God who breaks our chains? Come on, let's continue to sing to our victorious Jesus. Sing Man of Sorrows. Man of Sorrows, Lamb of God, by his own betrayed the sin of man and wrath of God has been on Jesus lay sing he was silent
Welcome Horizon West Church. Bem-vindos, amigos. Sejam bem-vindos, meus amigos. God is so good, right? Celebrate this week what He has done for us on the cross. It's just amazing. And if you are with us for the first time, we would love to get to know you. So send the word connect to 40777. In that form, you can indicate if you want to learn more about us, if you want to have a coffee with Pastor Chris, if you want to know more about what our church is all about, and even if you want to baptize Sunday, you can sign that up on that card. And the way you can do, can do electronically, or you can get the card that is on your seat and drop at the check-in desk in the front when you came in, the check-in uh, counter. But Easter is this next week. Can you imagine that? And the way we're going to celebrate that, we're going to join Oasis Church, and we're going to have a service Sunday morning, 9 o'clock, and I'm going to tell you the right time, 9 o'clock, 10, 15, 11:30. And the way you're going to do, you can go on Horizon West Church Easter and you can RSVP for that. And invite a friend. That is a wonderful time to invite people. People want to come to church at Easter. So bring them and just make sure they know Jesus died, but he's not dead. He's alive. Amen. And another thing we're going to do Friday night, we, you're going to have an opportunity to go on Facebook, Horizon West Facebook website, or even YouTube, and join us to Easter experience. We're going to have a Good Friday experience at 6 o'clock at night. I brought my phone to cheat, but it's not working. So they give me all these numbers that I have to remember. Excuse me, look at my age. I'm not that young. So, but you're going to get a uh, text with that information. We're going to be sharing that many times during the week and reminding you Friday night, let's get together as a church and watch a video that is just 20 minutes to celebrate what Jesus did on the cross for us. Let's give uh, some time for our giving now. If you are here, you can just send the word giving to 40777. But above all, it's the, so good to know that we can give to the Lord and can, it, He can use that for so many great things. Pastor Chris is going to share today what happened today in this campus. And that happened because of our giving. We are faithful to Him and He's faithful to us. Amen. So let's pray. Jesus, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We don't even deserve to be here today. You know our sins. You know us so well. But you still love us. And you pay the price for our sins. So today we want to give back not just our offerings, our uh, resources. But we want to give back to you our lives. So you can do with it whatever you want to do for your glory. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Magnified. 
sing it if you believe it. Christ be magnified in me. Sing it, oh, Christ be magnified. Let his praise arise. Christ be magnified. Thank you for the cross. It has broken every chain. That we as broken vessels can magnify the name of Jesus because of what you did on the cross and the sacrifice you made for each and every one of us, no matter where we are. We thank you for just the grace that you have for us. Like I said, you just meet us right where we are, but you don't leave us as we are. Lord, we thank you for this time of worship we have had. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You guys can be seated. Thank you, team, for leading us. Welcome to Horizon West Church. Uh, if a few of us look a little tanner than normal, uh, it's because we did a thing today. The thing was called Spring Fling, and I feel like I'm rhyming all of a sudden. Um, 
How many of you are here uh, today helping out, either attending or serving? You can throw your hands high. We are so grateful for you. Um, what an incredible event. We checked in 347 individuals. We believe, yeah, you guys can applaud that. That's awesome. Uh, we believe that total number is probably closer to around 400, which would make it uh, quite likely the biggest uh, event that we've been able to do as a church of course, in partnership with Oasis, what an incredible uh, thing to see God bless, and thank you for those that were able to participate. Hey, uh, I'm excited tonight, you guys. I get to, to pick up where Austin, um, our director of missional communities, where Austin left off in his message last week. And so we're going to be in John chapter 17, if you've got a Bible or Bible app. Uh, we'll also have that on the TV next to me. But just to kind of refresh, and if you weren't here to kind of bring you up to speed, uh, Austin shared rightly that as Jesus is praying in John chapter, chapter 17, it's his final public prayer. And what he's doing is entering into the space of a, a priest or of a high priest. And what the high priest would do is he would represent the, uh, the, um, represent the people to God. Somebody is trying to get a hold of us right now. And maybe the Lord is speaking now. <laughs> Now, now, as we talk about the priestly ministry of Jesus, you need to know that most of Jesus' earthly ministry was what would be called prophetic ministry. Prophetic ministry is speaking to the people for God. So Jesus would say things like, you've heard it was said, but I tell you. He was representing God to the people. But in John 17, Jesus is going to step into the priestly ministry, representing the people to God. And Austin pointed out that at the beginning of this prayer in John 17, Jesus is primarily dealing vertically with his relationship with the Father. He's going to th say things, you'll hear it in just a second, but he's going to say things like, uh, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had before you, uh, with you, before the foundation of the world, Jesus and the Father. But in verse 6 or thereabouts, Jesus is going to pivot and he's going to go horizontal. He's going to begin praying for his disciples. And as you'll see, ultimately praying for us. And so we're going to pick it up uh, right there. Um, every Monday, I, I gather with a few folks from Horizon West Church, and, and they help me to kind of think through the passage that I'm going to be preaching on the weekend. And as we looked at John 17 together, these were two of the things uh, that some of those individuals said. One said, it seems like John 17 is Jesus' vision casting for the church. Another one said, it feels like he's setting the stage for his disciples. I think you're going to see both of those things as we read. Look now at John chapter 17. I'm going to read this entire prayer of Jesus, and then we'll pick it up after that. Now, when Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. Since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him, and this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory I had with you before the world existed. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you, for I have given them the words that you gave me, and they received them, and they have come to know in truth that I came from you. And they have believed that you sent me. I'm praying for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. Verse 11. I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost except the son of destruction, that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself, that they also may be sanctified in truth. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you. 
that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them that they may be one even as we are one. I in them and you in me that they may be perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you have loved me. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you and these know that you have sent me. I made known to them your name and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. Now, this is obviously a prayer of Jesus, and it, and it can serve for us as kind of a model prayer. One of the things that, that jumped off the pages in looking at this was the parallel that I see in Jesus' prayer with what we know of as the Lord's Prayer. You remember that one? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The, the first part of Jesus' prayer is going to be that Father in heaven part, right? Where he's saying, Father, glorify me, glorify me in your presence with the glory that I had with you. But the second part is going to be that thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In fact, I would submit to you that the way that Jesus says the words on earth as it is in heaven in chapter 17 of John is in them as it is in me. In them as it is in me. And so what I want to do for the next 20, 25 minutes or so is look at what those things are that are true of Jesus that he's going to say, oh, by the way, these are also true of or to be true of those who are my followers. Here's the first one. True of Jesus, true of us. Number one, that we are set apart from the world just as Jesus was set apart from the world. Did you see that in verse 14 through 17? I'm going to just quickly reread that. He says, I've given them your word and the world's hated them because they're not of the world just as I am not of the world. Uh, Let me jump back down. 17, they are not of the world just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. He says it two times. They are not of the world in the same way that I am not of the world. The value that I think Jesus is inferring on his disciples here is the value of holiness. Now, some of you, when you hear the word holiness, your mind goes in a bunch of different places, right? For some of you, the idea of holiness, what was a thousand pound weight that a parent or a pastor or somebody put on you and you said, I can't be holy, right? Like, how do I be holy? But you need to know that the word holiness comes from a word in Hebrew that, that, that the word is kodesh. And what it means is not somehow like someone who walks on water or has halos over their heads. Kodesh means someone who is set apart, someone who is distinct. The Israelites of the Old Testament were to be distinct and different from the nations around them. And Jesus says, I want my followers to be distinct and set apart from the world. In fact, they are as different as I am. The way I was taught this when I was younger is is a little uh, phrase that goes like this. We are to be in the world, but not of the world. You guys all heard that. That's a good one. In the world, but not of the world. Now, someone developed three approaches. These are not mine. They're not original to me, but three approaches that we can take when it comes to culture. I think we've got these on the screen here. Uh, one is that we receive the culture, okay? Uh, the person who is uh, receptive to culture is the person who is unfiltered. Whatever the culture produces in its movies, in its music, in its philosophies, they just absorb it. They just receive it. That's not the posture we want to have. Another group of people do this, though. They reject the culture. Whatever the culture puts out, they they say, that's bad, that's wicked. We don't have anything to do with that. These are the, the monastic types, right? They remove themselves from anything that could possibly taint them, and they cut themselves off from people who are of the world, and they reject it. Jesus said we're not to do that either. This is what we're to do. We're to redeem the culture. We're to recognize that what is coming from the world's system is not from God. 
And yet we engage with the world system in such a way that they see something different in us. And as it says in Matthew 5, that as we shine our light in the darkness, they may see our good deeds and praise our Father in heaven. That, that we're to have a redemptive role when it comes to the world around us. But I think what's really interesting is that in today's age, the church by and large has bought into a myth. It is not true. The church of today has by and large said this, if we could become more like them, and we use the term relevant, then people would get saved. And here's what we found. The more that we tried to become like the world, the less they saw anything in us that was attractive. Why become like you if you're no different than me? Jesus said there's to be a difference. There's to be something different. The world should feel as foreign to us as it did to Jesus. You know that Jesus was never at home in the world, right? Though he created it, formed it with his own breath, he was never at home in it. First time I ever left the country was in 2001. I was 19 years old, and I went on a missions trip to Haiti. Oh, I thought I'd get a shout out there. Okay, <laughs> we'll get one in the next one. I went to Haiti, and I've now been to Haiti four times. Uh, one of those was immediately after the earthquake of 2010. I have grown, my wife and I both, to love Haiti and to love the Haitian people. But the first time I went, first time leaving the country, and showing up in a culture where they didn't speak the same language, and the homes looked really, really different, and there was no air conditioning at night, and you woke up when the rooster crowed at sunrise. You heard the phrase culture shock? <laughs> that was me. Day two, I'm like, how do I get out of here? <laughs> and I was like a trip leader. Like we had taken high school students down there. I'm like, I got to get out of here. By day 10, I'm like, how do I get back here? right? Because what was foreign became familiar. Now that's a good thing if God's put a heart in you for a culture that was hard to relate with at first, but that is not a good thing when it comes to the world system. Ah, it's a little more comfortable now. It's a little more familiar. I, 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 could, I could live here. I could be comfortable here. We've all heard the saying, familiarity breeds contempt, but I would submit to you that familiarity can also breed complacency. The more familiar we are with a thing, the more complacent we are to the impact it's having on us. Like the frog in the pot of boiling water, who when he started out, the water was room temperature and it just kept getting cranked another little bit at a time and it felt just a little warmer and just a little warmer and the next thing it's boiling. So I am afraid that many believers... And many churches have become so accustomed to the world around us, so comfortable with the world system, we have forgotten that Jesus said, it should be as foreign to you. You are to be as set apart in it as I myself am. Now guys, I have been wrestling with this on a personal level. I would call this the call to discipleship. This isn't the walking the aisle, getting saved moment. This is discipleship. When you say, like we used to sing this old song, the world behind me, the cross before me, no turning back. You remember that? That's the call to discipleship. And here's what I'm wrestling with in my own life. Am I really all in on the gospel? Or have I picked up a, a bad habit here? And a way of thinking over here? And a comfort level here to where I'm just kind of blending right in? This is what the radical call to Jesus sounded like in the New Testament. And keep in mind that the gospel never changed. Luke chapter 9, verse 23, Jesus himself, he said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. One early follower of Jesus, James, said it this way, you adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? If you want to be a friend of the world, you've made yourself an enemy of God. Or how about another of Jesus' disciples, John? Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Can I give you one more? The Apostle Paul, Galatians 6.14. 
Far be it for me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Are you getting a theme here? The first followers of Jesus understood what Jesus was praying. You know why they didn't feel home in the world? Because they were being beaten and imprisoned. And their light shined so brightly that the world tried to snuff it out. If the world isn't trying to snuff you out, could it be it's because you've become much like them? See, this is a personal wrestling. Maybe it resonates with you as well. This is the question I'm asking myself and I submit to you as well. Do your relationships and conversations and the way you spend your time and money reflect that the gospel of Jesus Christ is your all-consuming priority? We're going to let that sit for a minute. Friends, this life, be it 40 years, 80 years, 90, it's going to be over one day. And you're not going to say, man, if only I had accumulated a little bit more wealth. Man, if I only had fit in a little bit better in this thing called the world. You're going to say, I wish I had been able to say the world behind me, the cross before me. That is all that matters. We are set apart. Secondly, we are sent into the world just as Jesus was sent into the world. Let me read again verses 18 and 19. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world, and for their sake I consecrate myself, that they may be sanctified in truth. The value here that I see is the value of mission. This answers the question that you might have asked yourself at times. Why leave Christians in the world after salvation? Have you ever wondered about that? I mean, it seems like the moment that you get in the life raft called salvation, it's like, let's go home, right? Who is it? Kenny Chesney. Everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to go now, right? But it's like, why? If, if, it's, think about it from God's perspective. Like, oh, that person's saved. Okay, I'm going to bring him to heaven. Right? Why, why doesn't it work like that? Here's why. Because God has, in his sovereign wisdom, left us in the world to continue the mission he began. The only way that others will hear the good news of Jesus is because God left Christians among them to be salt and light and bearers of good news. That's why you exist. And it's the only reason you're still on earth if you've come to faith. So, so what is the mission of Jesus? Here it is, Luke 19.10. This is the mission. The Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. That's about as clear as it gets, right? Right? Not a whole lot of businesses can have a mission statement that concise. Jesus said, this is why I came. I came on a rescue mission. And if we've been given the mission of Jesus, if we are sent into the world just as he was, then that also is our mission. Now, here's the reality. Jesus loved the people of the world and hated the pattern and practices of the world. But many Christians have this exactly backward. We kind of like it here. We just don't like the people that we live next, with, next door to, right? We, we like it here. We just don't like the, the people we have to work with. Jesus was crucified by the world system, and yet he loved even those who were crucifying him. So we, we got we to gotta flip this around. This is what it means to be in the world, but not of it. That, that we engage, that we go into the places that are hard to reach, that, that we go as salt and light to our neighborhoods and our workplaces as Jesus himself was. In fact, did you know that in the Gospel of John, where we are in John 17, 39 times Jesus says about himself that he was sent by the Father. When somebody says something 39 times, there's intention behind it. He's trying to make sure the disciples get it. I didn't just show up. The Father has sent me. The work that I do, the teachings that I unpack, the, the, the death that I die, all of that was commissioned, all of that was sent by the Father. In fact, in chapter 17 alone, he's going to say it six times. Now, if someone is, in, is sent, the implication is that their job is to accomplish the will of someone else right? Like if you work for yourself and, and you make a phone call and you say, hey, I'm the business owner and I just want to sell you this product, that's one thing. But if you work for someone else, your job is to make them profit, right? Your job is to do their will. 
read a quote that Nikki shared with me from a book she's reading by Paul David Tripp. Um, This is the quote. It's a great quote. I want to just share it. I think we might have it on the screen as well. He says, The only thing an ambassador does is to faithfully represent the message, methods, and character of the leader who sent him. Everything he does, every decision he makes, every interaction he has must be shaped by one question. What is the will and plan of the one who sent me? You know, we are God's ambassadors. That's what Paul says, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 18 and 20. This is what he says. All of this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us, We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Paul could not get comfortable in the world because the one who sent him said, you got to stand out. You're going to suffer, Paul, but you're my ambassador and you got to do my will. And we have the same commissioning. This is why we use this expression a lot, this, this phrase or this sentence at Horizon West Church. We say our desire is to be a diverse community of good friends together doing good works and sharing the good news of Jesus. We believe that that is the commissioning of every person who comes to Christ, but we believe that's something that God has particularly birthed in our congregation. And that last part is so important that we share the good news of Jesus. It's why we were sent into the world. Let's go to number three. Number three, we are unified with each other just as Jesus is with the Father. Okay, now I'm going to put a little bit of an asterisk here because I can't quite figure out if that's true or if that's supposed to be true. <laughs> Can I just be perfectly honest with you? All these other things, it's like we're, we're sent in as he is, okay, check. We're, we're set apart just as he is, check. We're unified as the father and son, Ooh, don't think so, <laughs> right? Perhaps this is an aspirational value. Perhaps this is Jesus' prayer. Perhaps this is the one that's dependent on us that we've got to do the work. Now, if the the first part of Jesus' prayer has a primary emphasis, I would say that it's the glory of God. That word glory shows up again and again in the first six verses. But the word that shows up the most in the latter part of the passage is the word one. This seems to be the unifying theme of Jesus' prayer. Father, I want the church to be unified. We see it first in verse 11. Verse 11, he says, uh, keep them in your name which you have given me that they may be one even as we are one. He says it again in verses 20 through 23 on several occasions. Jesus desires that his people be one. Now what's not surprising to me is that Jesus would pray for us to be unified, that Jesus would pray for us to be on mission or for us to be set apart. Those aren't surprising to me. Here's what was surprising to me as I studied this week. It was surprising to me that Jesus expected those things to be as true of us as they were of him. That is a game changer. Not just a little bit unified. Jesus says, no, 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 here's the model. Okay? If you're gonna, if you're gonna color the picture, here's the picture you're coloring. My relationship with the Father, Son and Father in the in the Trinity. That's how I want the church to function. Now, Jesus knows that's gonna be super messy right? Jesus knows it's not going to be easy or natural for us to be one because we've got different desires and different views and different um, ideas about things. And yet Jesus says, it is important that you be one. You know, even Jesus' disciples, those guys weren't all the same. Several of them were fishermen, but you know, Jesus introduced a couple of guys who who were wildly different from each other. One was a guy named Simon the Zealot. You know who the Zealots were? Uh, That's the the burn it down camp. (laughs) That's the overthrow Roman rule. If it costs us our life, like we're going all the way, bear the sword. And Jesus said, Simon, follow me. And then Jesus turned around and said, no, by the way, Matthew, tax collector, the one that gathers money from the Jewish people and gives it to the Romans, you follow me as well. And Jesus was reconciling, and and in even that band of 12 disciples, Jesus was demonstrating, I want unity, but not uniformity. 
I, I want you to think a little differently. I want you to look different. I want you to speak different languages. I want you to have different cultures and experiences. And there's going to be a beauty in that when it's all brought together in the cross. It's going to be unifying. Nikki and I have started watching The Chosen. I've talked about it a few times. Some of you guys have started that as well. I'm just going to make a quick plug. It's, it's an app called The Chosen. You can watch it through your phone or project it on, a, on a several things. I'm not getting paid to say that, by the way. <laughs> Nobody cares what I say. So, you know, um, I mean, you care, but anyway. I hope you care. Um, but the, in the Chosen app, one of the things, and I haven't even gotten there yet. I just saw it in the trailer. But, you know, these disciples, this, this one guy, Matthew, the tax collector, he's kind of the outlier. Like, if you're the other disciples, you're like, we're kind of cool with each other, but not with that guy. And there's a scene in the show, and I love, and it's, this isn't straight out of the Bible, but you can imagine this, this interaction happening. They say to Jesus, they say, Jesus, he's just, he's different, and Jesus turns around and says, get used to different. See, if we're going to be unified with each other in any sort of way that looks anything like the Father and the Son, we're going to have to get used to different. We're going to have to get comfortable with people that think differently and speak differently and wouldn't necessarily have done it the way that we would have done it. And yet, here we are as followers of Jesus and what matters most is Him. And his gospel. Now, I believe that this is a biblical value more so than it is a cultural one. Anytime we talk about diversity, you know, that's, that's popular in our, in our culture now. But, but there's sort of a facade happening here, and I just want to expose it for a second. I believe the world actually has very little interest in uni unity among diverse people. What the world wants is to produce people that all think and act and behave like the world, right? So news media, social media, most of our colleges and universities, they're not promoting diversity as much as they are promoting uniformity of thought. The place we have a chance to highlight true diversity is in the church. We should be leading the way. We should be setting the standard People should look at us and go, I've never seen anywhere where people choose not only to be in a, the same organization, but to be in friendship with each other when they are this different from each other. That's why that first part of our mission is so important, that we be a diverse community of good friends. It's not enough to have diverse people in your tribe. Do you have them at your table? Do you know people who are different than you? Are your children being raised not only in school with others, but in relationship with others who are different from them? And this is why it's so important. Because Jesus says in verse 23, that the world may know that you sent me. Friends, this is not a small thing. Do you remember in John chapter 13, Jesus has just finished washing the disciples' feet. By the way, he did that while Judas was still in the room. And then he says to the disciples, here's how everyone's going to know that you're my disciples. Do you remember? It's how you love one another. There is something in the way that we love each other. There's something in the way that we are unified together that tells a watching world what they believe is true. What they believe is real. When the church is unified, the world becomes convinced and God is glorified. I think that's the progression Jesus wants to build. When the church is unified, the world becomes convinced and God is glorified. Here's number four and our last one. We are loved by the Father just as Jesus is loved by the Father. Two, two verses, verse 23 and 26. I in them and you in me that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and that you loved them even as you loved me. Verse 26, I made known to them your name and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you loved me may be in them and I in them. The value here that I think Jesus is trying to transfer to the disciples is an understanding of how deeply they are loved. Did you know that so much brokenness in our world comes from a simple misunderstanding of people not knowing how much God loves them? 
I mean, it manifests itself in all kinds of ways, but if you were to get to the heart of it, they're still thinking they've got to win God's approval, that they've got to, to do enough things or stack enough, and they've been shamed, and they've been guilted, and they've been wounded, and most often in religious circles, and they've said, I'm not doing that anymore. And Jesus says, whoa, whoa, whoa time out, time out. If you know me, the very same love the Father has for me is in you. You are deeply and dearly loved by the Father. It's one thing to be loved. It's another thing to receive love. There's been some girls in my past before I was married. They were loved by me, but they did not receive my love. (laughs) There's a difference. Jesus is saying, I I know the Father loves them, but I, I want them to know how much my Father loves them. Do you know that God loves you that way? Do you accept, do you receive the fact that God loves you like that? Consider one place where we see the manifest love of the Father for the Son. Luke chapter 3. I think this might be the last passage we look at together. Luke 3, verses 21 and 22. Now when all the people were baptized and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heavens were opened and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove and a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved Son, With you, I am well pleased. We're going to leave this up here for a second. Now, I need to highlight two things, and both are important. The first is this. Jesus is uniquely the Son of God. No one before and no one since can claim to be the eternal Son of God, sinless, sent into the world to redeem. No one, Jesus alone, fills that description. But it is also true That when you come to faith in Jesus, you become a child of God. John 1, 12, to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God so that by faith, the same thing Jesus said, uh, that the father said to Jesus, he says to you. You are my beloved son. You're my beloved daughter. With you, I am well pleased. You go, man, what did I do to earn that? Nothing. Nothing. Jesus earned that for you. Jesus went as what Paul calls in Colossians, the firstborn from the dead, the eldest brother. And just like an older brother in ancient times was the inheritor of the estate, Jesus said, hey, I've got the inheritance. And guess what? I'm sharing it with all of you. If you want a piece of it, come to me. And Jesus is going to dole out the grace, the love, the mercy, and the inheritance of God to everyone who comes to him by faith. Now, why does this matter for Jesus? Like, well, why does Jesus, he knows he's God's son, right? Why does it matter that Jesus hears, and we don't have evidence that anybody else heard it, by the way. Did you, have you ever thought about that? There's no evidence that anyone else heard the voice besides Jesus, but Jesus heard it. You are my son, my beloved son. With you, I am well pleased. Why did that matter? Well, here's why. Because one chapter after this, He's going to be in the desert, and he's going to be hungry, and he's going to be tempted, and the enemy is going to say, if you are the son of God, and he's going to strike at the issue of sonship. And that's not the only time. There's a time when Peter, in in Matthew chapter 16, he makes this great declaration. He says, Jesus, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Peter immediately does some quick math and goes, And so, Jesus, there's no way that you'll suffer in Jerusalem. He's thinking, sons of God don't suffer. And Jesus says, do you remember? He says, get behind me, Satan. It's like, whoa. It's like, was Jesus having a bad day? Like, that's how I used to think about that. Like, that's really strong language. No, Jesus understood. Jesus understood the enemy was whispering the same old lie. Sons don't suffer. You're suffering in the desert. You're being rejected by the world. You're going to go suffer on a cross. There's no way you can be God's beloved son. And then what happens when Jesus is hanging on the cross? You remember what the criminal on his right says, or the one on his left? He says, if you are really the son of God, come down from the cross. Over and over. If you are, if you are. Did you know the enemy sings the same song over you? If you were really a child of God, your marriage would be better. If you were really a child of God, you wouldn't struggle with this sin. If you were really a child of God, he would protect you from this disease. And you need to hear the Father saying the words, this is my beloved son, my beloved daughter, and I am pleased with you. 
It matters. One other, one other place that I want to go in, in this whole moment of Jesus' trial, and this I'm probably over time, but this is too good not to share. You remember when Jesus was on trial and he's standing before Pontius Pilate and they bring out another person, right? A guy named Barabbas. And Barabbas is one of the zealots. He's been burning it down. He's been rioting, killing. He's like a bad, bad dude. And do you remember the question Pilate poses to the crowd? He says, who do you want me to release for you? Jesus, who is called the Christ, or Barabbas? Do you know what Barabbas means? Bar, Abbas, son of the father. Even in that moment, the enemy is playing with Jesus' mind, trying to get him to think, the son of the father is released. Why do I have to go die? And Jesus knew to see his circumstances in light of his relationship with the father and not the other way around. See, when we see our relationship with God through our circumstances, we go, there's no way God could love me. There's no way I could be saved. There's no way this could be true because I'm, But when you look at your relationship with the Father who loves you as he loved Jesus, you say, God, I'll go through this trial. I'm willing to embrace the suffering. I'm okay with the struggle because your love rests on me. It is in me and it is for me. Remember the first day that my oldest daughter Addison was born, Um, I've always struggled, if I can just be candid, I've always struggled with the concept of God as a loving father. Some of you may relate with that. It just never resonated with me. I have a whole bunch of brothers. It resonates to think of Jesus as my oldest brother somehow, but the love of the father never connected. And then my little girl was born, 24 weeks old, one pound, nine ounces. It's mayhem. It's crazy. It's scary. What's going on? And they wheel Nikki into the recovery room. They, They take me into the neonatal intensive care unit and they show me into a room and there's this plastic box and a little girl in it and on the outside it says baby girl Ogden and I went oh (laughs) this what I feel right now God feels that for me and I'm sinful like I'm not even a great person and I feel this overwhelming I I remember standing there looking at her going I kind of hope a semi-truck does come so I can jump in front of it. Like, I'm, I will lay down my life in a heartbeat for this child. She hadn't done anything for me. I was just her dad. God isn't looking for your performance. He wants your relationship. He wants your love. And it's from this place, this place of God's unimaginable, unconditional love, that we can embrace all of these other truths. See, when we understand that God's love for us is unconditional, and we're set apart from the world, then we ask the question like this, why would we trade sonship for something else? Or being sent into the world, we we get to invite others into this family of God that we get to be part of. Or unity, we we take the posture of, man, we got a whole bunch of siblings that we got to learn to get along with because we have a father who loves us deeply. Jesus is going to rise from the prayer of John 17. And he's going to go into a garden where a guy named Judas is going to say, this is the one. And he'd be betrayed. He'd be tried, beaten, mocked, stripped, and hung up on a cross, crucified for us. If there was any doubt in your mind of God's great love for you, I would invite you to look at the cross. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him would not perish, but have eternal life. I'm going to ask you where you're at just to close your eyes for a minute. Those watching online, you can participate in this moment as well. We would ask you to. I didn't want to bring us to this moment of the love of God and the sacrifice of Jesus and not give someone the opportunity to maybe receive it for the first time. Say, Chris, I can can relate with feeling not good enough. I understand that I've sinned. I understand that I've, I've fallen short of God. But now I understand that God loves me anyway. That his death and his resurrection was enough for me. And I want to put my faith in Jesus. And I just want to invite anybody that's ready to have that moment. God's stirring in your heart. I just want you to lift your hand up so I can see it. So I can pray for you. Anywhere in the room? Yeah. Any others? Let me pray.
pray for us. Father, I thank you for the good news of Jesus. God, I thank you for an older brother who wasn't ashamed, wasn't afraid to go to the cross to win us the inheritance. Lord, he is our champion. God, I thank you for the good news of salvation. I thank you that by grace through faith alone, we can come into relationship with you. God, as we look forward to Easter Sunday next week, the the moment of that resurrection, we're going to celebrate that together. Lord, I pray that no one would leave here, that nobody would leave, that nobody would turn their phone, their computer off who's watching online without first surrendering their life to Jesus, saying, Lord, I receive you as my Savior. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.
I don't know about you, but I'm so glad I joined tonight, today, because I was washed for the love of God. Have you felt the love of God today? Have you made the decision to follow Him? If you made that decision, please send the word connect to 40777, even fill this card and leave in the metal box in the check-in desk. And if you want to take the next step of baptism, what can we do next? Yes, Jesus, I receive your love. Have you been baptized? If not, next Sunday we're going to have baptism. So let us know if you want to be part of that. And we enjoy seeing you here today. So we see you next time. We hope that you are blessed by the service today. If you would like to learn more about what it means to follow Jesus or for more information about our church, just text the word CONNECT to 40777 and fill out our digital CONNECT card. The CONNECT card is the easiest way that you can take your next step, whether that's following Jesus for the very first time or getting connected to one of our small groups or serve teams. We pray that you have a great week and hope to see you next time.